So we're back with Roy McIntyre and we're going to have a, a great chat about flying and living in uh, in the Falklands with the F3. So Roy, how did you get first posted to the Falklands? Well, I actually uh, had avoided the Falklands for uh, quite a while actually and it was, I was getting a bit of a reputation uh, simply because um, when I was on the Phantom on 43 Squadron I was due to go and then I was posted to the F3 the F3 wasn't going down there for a while, and then just when they started to post people down and they put, deployed the, the F3 down to the Falklands, uh, I went on to the OEU, the Operational Evaluation Unit, and they didn't supply in a day. So I managed to do some escape and evasion for quite a while, but when I went back to 43 in 97, they finally caught up with me, and that was going to be my first of 13 deployments down there. Wow. So, yeah. Um, well, obviously, it was just coming to the, the the Phantom was just coming to the end of its uh, service operational life, um, but they wanted to make sure that the F three was going to be supportable, that it could do the job, the engineering infrastructure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there was quite a time, um, and indeed, towards the end of the Phantom's life in the Air Force, the the Watersham Wing were carrying the Falklands deployment mm. wholly on their own. And there was some sharp eyes looking across towards Coningsby and gleaming and and uh, lookers going, well, come on, guys, when are you going to start and help us? Um, <laughs> so it did take a wee while, actually, um, before they were confident to move the airframes down. But it was just a one-for-one a -one swap, i.e. four Phantoms down there. They put four F3s down there um, to do the same job, which is um, maintain the airspace integrity around the Falklands. And when you went over to the Falklands, um, did you fly over the F3s or were you in the back of a VC-10 or a Herc uh, or anything like that? I uh, know, we're down on the airbridge. Uh, they had already got them down, although they were, they obviously have to cycle airframes home um, for major servicing. Uh, and to begin with, that was done with a VC-10 and a very long transit um, and through the ascension and back. Um, latterly, they brought in a Russian civilian large aircraft, uh, the Ruslan, I think it was, um, and they could take the wings and the fin off it and pack them in the back of that, and they could just fly them all the way back to the UK in a one um, a lot more simple. Um, but to answer your question, every time I went down there, it was on the air bridge, which initially was TriStars out of Bryce and then eventually went to a civilian contract, which produced a whole cocktail of different civilian airliners, Slightly more comfortable than a TriStar. But that's the first thing about, I have to say about the Falklands. It's a long way away, about 8,000 miles. And the journey to get there is a bit of a pain. It's effectively 24 hours by the time you arrive at Bryce Norton till you get off and get into your accommodation at Mount Pleasant. Um, it's a long journey. And same going home, only a little bit more stressful because you're worried about service abilities of the bridge to get you home. So, yeah, it, it was great when you got there, but it was a bit of a pain in the travel. So, uh, on that air bridge, like, uh, did you have food on board? Like, what was, like, the transit yeah, like? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't uh, British Airways standard, but we, we <laughs> had food. And, and they had little mini video players and, and stuff like that, so you could watch a film and stuff like that. So uh, it was it was reasonable. The, the main problem is the length of time. It was about, if I remember correctly, heading southwards, it's eight and a half hours to Ascension Ooh. and seven and a half hours onwards from Ascension down to uh, the Falklands. So it's a long time to be on an aircraft. You get maybe an hour, hour and a half, two hours, depending on what's going on, um, just sitting in ascension in a little area known as the cage, because it is the cage. It's an open air thing, but it's enclosed to keep passengers corralled. Um, and there's a tea bar and what have you there. But yeah, it was it was a long journey down. So it was, it was, it was good to get there. And of course the best bit about it, um, as you approach the Falklands, generally speaking, serviceability allowed, um, the F3s would come up and intercept the air bridge. And so yes. you'd come down and you'd have um, F3s on the, on the wing, which is uh, good for everybody to see, because it's a reminder of what it's all about. And of course, the um, uh, airliner coming in, and they could see it from about 200 miles out. And of course, it's on a timetable, on a flight plan. Um, it was a good intercept practice for the um, 
for the F3s on the ground and the um, fighter controllers, airspace battle managers, um, to effect an intercept, which was just part of the, the basic job we would be doing down there. So for the folks who are not familiar with the Falklands, why were the RAF actually in the Falklands, uh, the Falkland Islands? Right, well, this all comes back from, well, mostly from the, the 1982 conflict, but it goes all the way back to the 1700s where there's an argument who, who to whom does the Falkland Islands belong? Um, and from pretty much the 17, late 1700s, uh, the United Kingdom has claimed them. Um, and obviously Spain and then Argentina have countered that. And there were um, various attempts, but the big one was in 1982 with the invasion, which was then finally repelled. Um, it must be said that the uh, armed forces pre that 1982 war were pretty minimal. Mm -hmm. It actually was 40, 40 commandos, uh, wow. Royal Marine commandos. When the Argentine um, forces invaded, it happened to be on a changeover period, so there was 80 Royal Marines there, but it still mm. wasn't enough. That was it, plus the local, effectively, TA, nothing else. Um, post the war, they, they decided that they needed to have a more robust defence structure from all three services. Um, and initially, it was fairly basic when the Phantoms and the Harriers were down there. Um, by the time we got there, I, I became involved. Um, Mount Pleasant Airport was built with much better facilities. Um, so the F3s are there as part of the air defence element, or where they're now being taken over, of course, by the Typhoon, uh, to maintain the integrity of the air airspace over the Falkland Islands um, fixed con conservation zone. But it's this area that um, effectively the Argentinians are not allowed to come into without invitation. Um, there's naval elements and there's army elements. And again, during my time, um, there were, there were um, rapier fire units, so there's rapier missiles, so you had ground-based air defence. So a much more structured and much more robust um, uh, defensive system. Of course, we also had three radar stations to provide much better radar coverage than they had in the in the 82 war. Um, so that was it. And it's a, an ongoing um, task, which the typhoons are continuing with to this day. Roy McIntyre goes to uh, the Falklands in 97 when you land did you know where you were going to bunk like where like you know like where the kitchen was yeah. anything like that yeah. can you talk yeah. through that uh, Rob? Um, obviously the first time you go down it's it's a bit new and all the rest of it but uh, once you've been down a couple of times it's like a pair of old slippers <laughs> you almost it's... know not quite which room you're going to go into because that depends. It's 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 the, the the crew going home have just vacated their rooms. You're going to go into theirs, and you're not always replacing uh, some uh, a crew off your own squadron. Um, so you know the corridor and the the Eagles corridor as it's called, um, decorated walls with with the squadrons. Uh, uh, badges and signatures of people down there with various funny dits, etc., etc., um, with a, a, a lounge at the end, uh, known as the Eagle's Nest. Yeah. Um, and you know where you're going. Um, so it's yes, it's very simple. It's it takes minutes, and you're back into the routine, and it's actually quite comfortable when you get there. You think, well, at least the journey's done and dusted. You can put your kit away, and then you know exactly what you're doing. So in that respect, it's good. Um, you obviously go down with a, a, a crew usually from your squadron, unless the way things work out, they, they had um, four and a half crews drawn from the squadron on a five or maybe six week rotation, all staggered. So effectively, you're changing a crew every every week. So you've not got a major right. train or something like that. You've always got a level of experience. The boss does a four month tour down there. Was it four months or was it two months? Can't remember. It doesn't matter. Um, so he's on his own, and he therefore needs a navigator or a pilot, depending on you know which uh, brevet he has. So the Sunday goes down as the boss's crewy, and then you have four squadron crews on a rotation coming from the squadrons. Um, so it's a real mixture. You know, generally, you'll know who you, the people are down there. The force wasn't that big, particularly with myself, having been on the, the force for, for some time. I would generally know everybody, pretty much, certainly knew the boss. Um, 
and and hopefully you get on with people that were there. There were sometimes there was some uh, niggles and and what have you, um, but generally, yeah, you always had space. There was plenty of recreation available at, at Mount Pleasant in the uh, accommodation block, which we called the Death Star. Huge, great thing. <laughs> um, all all ranks in there, but there were separate facilities based on the ranks. And of course, it was tri-service, although primarily Army and uh, Air Force. There was a naval element, but that tended to vary depending on whether the South Atlantic frigate destroyer was around. Um, so it was, it, was, it was good in that respect. You could get space, the recreation, the gym and, and a pool and what have you. Uh, like Obviously, you mentioned Army there. Did you get on well with them guys and gals over there? Um, it depended. Right, the there would be various support elements um, that would be there all the time. The variation that we saw would be what's called the RIC, um, the Resident Infantry Company, or mm. the Rulemont Infantry Company. And basically, there was an infantry company on rotation down there to provide soldiers on the ground, should it be required. And of course, that would they would change over. I can't remember what their rotation was, but it'd be a, from a, almost certainly a different regiment every time we went down. Uh, and they used that as training, not just to defend the, the ground around uh, Mount Pleasant, but they used it as training for future deployments. And most of the time, we'd be talking about Iraq or Afghanistan. Mm. So it was a good training ground for them. But we did see a huge variation in attitudes, and particularly you know, in the officers' mess of army officers, depending on which um, regiment it was um some were really really friendly some would love to cooperate offer facilities up the firing range etc etc and others were pretty much stuff shirts that didn't really want to talk to you and you thought okay oh, wow. fine. uh so let's get on to flying the tornado f3 uh in the falklands like what was it like and how did it differ uh compared to the uk right there's, there are there are stories and legends about <laughs> what went on in the Falklands. Oh yeah, <laughs> particularly the Phantom and the F3. What I'll say straight away is, I told myself the first time I went down there, there was nothing I could do down there that was going to impress anybody wow. without killing myself, because okay. it, it's all been done, um, and that's something I always try to impress on the younger guys when they came down, because effectively the, the airspace in the Falklands is pretty open. We're under the same rules. There's no sort of Falklands set of flying orders that don't apply in the UK or the UK rules don't apply in the Falklands. It's just freer airspace, not so much traffic in terms of the stuff around us, the Herc, there'd be the Chinooks in my day, the VC-10. Um, and then the Falkland Island, the Falkland Islands, the uh, Falkland Island government's air service, FIGAS, which had some uh, islanders that basically ferried around all the little strips, taxi, postman, delivering parcels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we had to be aware of them. Pretty much that was it. Okay. Um, the helicopters as well. Um, so flying was fairly free and easy in terms of airspace. There's a weapons range just to the north, but apart from that, there was some uh, wildlife avoids. <clears throat> but other than that, it was pretty good. Although I do remember one SACO. Um, senior air traffic control officer who was on detachment down there one time, he said, because the airspace over the uh, Mount Pleasant and over the Falklands was Class D airspace in UK rules, which he was correct, he then said, that means all aircraft below 10,000 feet are limited to 250 knots, mm -hmm. which in the United Kingdom, he is also correct. And he tried to enforce it. That lasted about half a morning. Before we said, don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. It's a bit yeah. like all the Formula One drivers pitching up at Silverstone and being told you can't drive any faster than 60 miles an hour, mate. On you go. No. So he got kicked into touch for that. So to come back to your point, yeah, it was fairly free and easy. The flying generally, because you had four aircraft and QRE was paramount, um, the moment there was any unserviceabilities or perhaps servicing, etc., tended to limit the number of aircraft who would be available for normal flying. Mm -hmm. You would expect to fly pairs. V very, very rarely did we get managed to get a four ship up. 
because that presents problems in terms of maintaining QRA. Um, four aircraft up, they all can't land at the same time because then nobody's on state. So you had to rely on a staged landing, the VC-10 being available to keep somebody topped up and effectively hold QRA airborne um, while the aircraft on the ground got turned, serviced, ready to take on QRA on the ground. Mm -hmm. Then the ones airborne could land. So it was a major logistics, but not impossible, but we tended to reserve it for special days, um, Memorial days and Christmas day tended to put a four ship up. So to come back to uh, what we're saying, the flying program was generally a pair in the morning, a pair in the afternoon, which may or may not involve the QRA crew as well. Um, you might get some flying with against the Hercules if it was around. Um, the VC-10 sometimes acted as a target and or maybe one of the Chinooks if it was available. Um, mm. You could do some uh, helicopter or fill. Um, but it was fairly basic stuff in terms of training. And we did use the opportunity to continue our training. But in the background, of course, it's QRA defending the airspace of the Falklands. And was uh, serviceability uh, heightened because it was such a small number of aircraft? Yeah, yeah, it was more critical because it didn't take long. If one aircraft dropped out, mm -hmm. then it obviously it would cause a ripple in the programme because you're then having to say, well, we can't, do we want to put two up? Yes, we probably could two up. If you had two out, you're then saying, well, we're not going to be flying two because you've got that problem of hold, who's holding QRA. You can mm -hmm. do it airborne, but you then got to stagger the landings to make sure you can get one on the ground to take over Q while the other one's still airborne and able to react. So generally, if we had two out, either through unserviceability or scheduled servicing, and then something breaks, that right. tends to make the program fall down. So it could be a little bit fragile. And of course, the other element that can affect the flying, which we haven't mentioned yet, but was probably the biggest, biggest challenge in the Falklands, is the weather. Mm -hmm. The weather was really could really be very unpredictable, and despite the fact we had a really uh, good Met office there and, and their computer systems, they were always being caught blindsided by some of the weather. Add into that the diversion. Now, back in the UK, weather diversions, you've got plenty of airfields around, um, most of which, you know, before you go flying, you would plan and you say, well, that's, you know, at Lucas, we've got lost of mouth. Lost of mouth weather is forecast to be excellent. We can use them as a diversion if something goes wrong. Um, uh, down in the Falklands, your primary diversion is the short runway, cross runway. Right. Which may or may not be usable. If we're talking about fog and cloud coming in, then you've got a problem. The next one is Stanley Airport, which is where the Phantoms used to operate yeah. from. There's a short section of runway which is a good good condition for the islanders, but it's effectively a very small airfield for light aircraft. The longer bit of runway that was there, the Vulcan raid type runway, mm -hmm. still there, but it's falling to bits and it's really in pretty poor state, but it's usable in an emergency. So that would be your next diversion. And we used to practice approaches to Stanley, so there oh, okay. wouldn't be a shock if we had to do it properly. But there were always low approaches to go around. And um, we'd never ever roll there because the chances of damaging the undercarriage, tires, stuff like that, wasn't worth the risk. Beyond that, if the weather was clamped over the whole of the Falklands, well, the, the next option would be to have the VC-10 airborne, if you're caught airborne, um, and have it feed you some fuel and hopefully between the two aircraft or three aircraft, whatever, um, there's enough fuel to keep everybody airborne until it clears up. And then beyond that, we look west and we're talking about Chile. Yeah. <laughs> and going there, while we have an agreed, there was an agreed procedure, it still would cause ripples diplomatically and stuff like wow. that. So that was very much the last ditch. So it was quite a tough job on terms in terms of the flying supervisors and the crews involved in flying at the time to keep, to use a cliche, a weather eye on things because it, it can change and it can catch you out. And I, and I was almost caught out once. I happened to be with OC Airwing in the back 
uh, wing commander. We were at Singleton on the far side of West Falkland um, when we got the weather recall. Um, so we and we knew it was probably going to happen, but we had primed them saying, "Give us as much clue as you can." So we got it. So we beat feet back across, and it was quite a a, a, mm. a difficult approach. In and we were effectively in in fog by the time we rolled out on the runway. It was a a damn close run thing, as they say. Um, so that's as close as I got to being diverted. So the weather's the big one that you had to watch all the time. And did you ever, uh, obviously in the UK, you used to practice, uh, you know, wings back uh, approach. Did you do that in the Falklands as yep. well? Yep, absolutely. All the basic routine, and not just for us, because air traffic need to keep up their stats as well. Right. So in terms of daily routine flying, it was the same as in the UK for everybody to keep these stats together. Now, yep. the air crew, apart from the boss, went down for five or six weeks which was looked on kind of sharply by the ground crew because they are down for for four months. The, re, the primary reason that we only went down for five or six weeks was um, simulator currency. Right. We'd do two sims before we go down. You could be down there for six weeks. You'd get an, um, an allowance to go beyond your month, not having, not having done a sim, but it would only go for about six weeks. Now, I can't remember how they got the boss was allowed down there for that time. But that's the reason that the, the air crew sort of turned over relatively quickly compared to the ground crew and the, and the other support staff down there who tended to be down there for four, maybe even six months, depending on what was going on. Um, but yeah, flying-wise, we're all still looking to pick up all the normal stats. And in things like the Chinook sense available for summer fill training, then we can incorporate that in to the... Uh, training that would have gone on back home on the home on our squadron back home. Um, so as a as a, a trainer as a as a weapons instructor, if I've got a junior nav with me, we can do some helicopter fill that can be translated back and recorded in our training folders and be just as valid as it would have been back in the UK. So there was opportunities to be had, but generally speaking, they were all of a smaller scale. In terms of numbers and extents of the of the of the of the um, exercises themselves, I'm sure you have like plenty of stories here, uh, Roy. But uh, have you got any like Q missions that you can maybe share with our viewers? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, there's, there was, as I say, the the the, the, the flying, uh, shall we say, the adventurous flying that went on was legion. Um, but basically, most of the the intercepts were or the exercise we're doing were either 1v1 or 2v1 or something like that and they tended to be low level mm -hmm. low level flying in the Falklands was good it was nice and open and also it was valid because going back to 1982 that's where the Skyhawks came in that's where the Mirages yeah. came in and the Daggers came in they came in low um, so we were uh, training for that environment a low level intruder um, while we weren't necessarily expecting a full blown war there was always the possibility of a, a rogue, run, a renegade aircraft mm -hmm. coming in, disenchanted pilot, all that. You could make up a scenario, but you could have a singleton coming in trying to do something heroic. Um, so that was the basis of the training. So a lot of it was down at low level. So we do that. And then, particularly for just a pair of us, having done a 1v1, if we had the tanker, we'd go up, refuel, and then we would go for what we call a bimble which is basically a patrol around the islands. Right. Just to familiar, familiarise the new crews with the landmarks, etc. Yeah. Chance to see. But the other big thing, and this has not changed, I'm sure that the Typhoon crews will tell you exactly the same, the islanders love us. They loved us in 1982, and they love us now. Mm -hmm. They are so pro-British, they're so pro-military, it is not true. And I actually, and one of the examples I had was we did the intercepts, we went to the tanker, we then went down and did a bimbo and round the islands and all the rest. And you're going around all the settlements and having a look, see, and if you see anybody wing, wing waggle and all that sort of stuff, nobody shakes their fist at you. There's none of right. that. Um, so we head back to the uh, MPA, and as a taxi in, shut the aircraft down in the ops room, uh, the boss uh, came up to me and said, uh, Roy, did you do a bimble? Such a, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, well, we've just had a telephone call from Saunders complaining. Oh, wow. Saunders Island. 
And I'm thinking, but I didn't go to Saunders Island. And they said, that's what I'm complaining about. They saw you turn three miles to the south, so they've just phoned up and said, what's wrong with us? So wow. you don't get that in the UK about low flying, oh, I'll no. tell you. They want, so, well, yeah, well, come to us, come and see us. So that was, that was one. So the low level bit is good. Um, there are some famous routes, it's like um, A4 Alley on uh, West Falkland, where the A4s came up and they were hiding behind a ridge um, just on the eastern edge of Falkland, of the Falkland, of, the, of West Falkland, as it meets Falkland Sound. So you can actually sit down behind this fairly sharp ridge and then pop up over the ridge and they would be attacking um, the task force in Falkland Sound and around... Um, yeah. Port San Carlos, so you can <coughs> excuse me, um, you can recreate <coughs> excuse me, uh, recreate what they were flying. But just imagining what an A4 pilot would have felt like going along mm, there, it's mm-hmm. quite a powerful feeling to think, right, I'm going to pop up here. I've just flown 400 miles. I've got two bombs under my wings here. I'm going to pop up, and when I get over this ridge, all hell's going to break loose in front of me because there's going to be ships everywhere. They're all going to be firing at me. I've got to find my target. I've got to drop my bombs, and then I've got to try and somehow escape and get out of it. And even though I'm in an F3 knowing there was nothing on the other side, the clear air, it was still quite a focused feeling, thinking, Christ, these guys had some guts to do this. Yeah. Had some guts. So the the low-level side is good. The other side is the high level bit because of course there's actually no restrictions up there at all and um, mm-hmm. so a lot of people got their high fast stats there because it's a, a lot simpler um to organize and easier in terms of the program to say take i've got a jet can i go and do my high you know high fast stuff um so a lot of people got their mach 2 tech 50 box, yeah. tech. <laughs> Rather than trying to do it in the in the North Sea area where it, it, it tends to be a bit difficult, mm-hmm. um, so that was generally the the, the the scope of the flying. Um, talking about uh, waving the flag and going to see people, the other thing we did frequently was to go and three, see the three radar stations. Um, yeah, yeah. Not necessarily all on the same trip, but you'd go and visit one or two. Um, we used to call it doing a measles. It was a, the, the, the name for for, a, for a, an attack. They were supposed to come out and do their thing as if they were defending it. They would be out there waving with tea cloths and what have you. Because some of the guys, particularly when the uh, airspace batter managers came away from the remote sites and were positioned in a central facility at Mount Pleasant, um, you really just had the radar technicians out there. And again, they're out there for four months with very little switchover and very little contact, mm. apart from the helicopters resupplying them with all their basic stuff. So any time the aircraft were going to come and see them, they would love it. Um, and that's where it could get a little bit sporting because you'd try and get up close to them before they even realised you were there. Particularly Mount Alice, I remember, in the in the south of uh, West Falkland. is basically on a bit of a dumpling of a hill. So it's quite steep slopes on all sides falling away to a low plateau which means you can stay well below the the uh, level of the radar site till you actually get quite close to them and you can maintain your 250 feet minimum separation distance all mm-hmm. legal um, but as you zoom up and go over the top you're usually inverted which is quite sporting um, you're still 250 feet ish um, away from the radar site but being upside down as you sort of fly over the top, is uh, it was always great fun, and they always loved to see that as well. Um, when I was coming up for my um, three thousand hours, uh, and it would had a period of bad weather, we'd been waiting to go. There was one aircraft serviceable as, as wrong with the Q aircraft, and the boss said, "Well, Roy, get airborne. The tanker's going to get airborne. How long? How many do you need? I, I, I needed about two hours and forty. Right, fly for two hours and fifty minutes. Get your three thousand hours. Because I was going home in a couple of days." Right, so we did that, did some intercepts with the, the uh, VC-10, flew around a bit, saw the Islanders, then were coming home. Um, so I'd got my 3,000 hours and uh, nice. my nav, as we're running in towards the airfield, said, uh, right, that's us going through 500 feet and that's my last height check. I know what you say, because you don't see any more. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'm flying on the Radalt 
I also had the Ma the, the the HUD set up for Mach as opposed to knots because I wanted to see exactly how close to the speed of sound I was. And uh, I lined myself up up over the squadron coming out. I could see the boys were up on the, the the banking around the squadron buildings seeing us coming in. And uh, this is where it went wrong because I wasn't paying attention. And I was looking at my height and I was looking at my lineup. What I wasn't looking at was my speed. And as right. I came in, I'd left the burners in just a shade too long. And as I went across the boundary, it was my 1.01. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> pulled the throttle back and thought, don't pull, because if there's any shock wave that hasn't detached yet, pulling, I'm going to put it to the back of the aircraft. It'll mm -hmm. drop off, so there'll be a boom. So I just pulled the throttle back and let the aircraft just rise up and then we broke into the circuit. Wow. And I went, damn, damn, damn. So I called downwind, air traffic were talking to me. I thought, well, that's a start. They're not screaming and shouting. Yeah. So we'd come downwind, turn finals, landed. And then uh, we had to, the, the way the airfield is laid out, we end up backtracking on the runway. There's, there isn't a taxiway that you can go to the end that'll take us back to where the, um, the fighters are based. So you end up backtracking. So requested backtrack, yep, yeah, clear. And then the air crew guy in the tower came on and said, well, Roy, was that your 3,000 hours? And I went, yeah, affirmative. He goes, congratulations. And I thought, hmm, I might well, have got this. Nobody's shouting at me. Yeah. Uh, and then a taxi then on the squadron frequency uh, spoke to the, the, the ops clerk and said, we're taxiing back in serviceable. And he says, yeah, you're going back to Housie too. And by the way, you've got some tidying up to do. And I went, oh, shh. Yeah. Okay. So what had happened? First off, there was a boom that hit the tower. Oh. Air traffic. The windows apparently flexed in and out, and wow. the air traffickers looked round to the guy, the air crew guy, um, as a bit like cricketers appealing for LBW. They went boom, and he went nah, that wasn't a boom. Right. So they went oh, okay, fair enough. Um, what had happened when I went over the squadron buildings was that they're all porta cabin type affairs. They're all fairly yeah. flexible, as they all did flex. And all the plastic covers on the fluorescent tube lights in the ceiling all fell out. Wow. And of course, there's been months and months of moths and dead wasps and stuff all over the floor. <laughs> so that was the clearing up bit. And at the end, I thought, well, okay, that's fair enough. I can do that. Yeah, what became apparent later on, and this was bad, was that the boom, which wasn't a boom, according to, uh, as ruled to air traffic, actually went in the doors of the fire section, which is underneath the tower, and knocked the space heating system off. Now, the space, the space heating was metal pipes that carried hot water, and they were on hangers, metal hangers, that just above the, or just hanging down from the ceiling, just to provide some sort of heating for the fire engines. Well, the, the clamps had, weren't very strong, had broken, pipe had come down, fractured, there's hot water going everywhere. It hit one of the fire engines. So, uh, formal letter of apology to the fire master, and uh, yeah, that's that's one that I wasn't proud of, anyway. Uh, so, and yeah, that's I didn't come in as fast ever again after. after. <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine. <clears throat> Generally not. Generally not. Very right. rare to see them down that way. Um, any naval uh, stuff we did was generally with the guard ship, which is a little, well, in our day, it was a castle class. I don't know what they are now, but it was Leeds Castle, Dumbarton Castle in my day. I think we then went to a river class. It was Clyde and something else. Anyway, there's a, there's a guard ship down there. Um, and then the South Atlantic frigate or destroyer may or may not call in at times uh, and could be available in my day. It was um, usually Type 22s. Type 23 frigates mm -hmm. or the Type 42 destroyers, you know, the Edinburgh, Yorks, Manchester type stuff. So they were quite good because they would have a helicopter as well and they would like to have ship attacks and what have you. So that was really about the only naval um, involvement we had. Um, and, and I never got to see an Argentinian either. I never got a live scramble against right. Argentina. They were fairly rare. And generally what would happen is we'd be their 707 reconnaissance on our lake yeah, or yeah. something like that that would sit on the outside of the exclusion zone right. trying to provoke a reaction, recording electronic emissions, 
that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, there was one, it was a cracker. I, we got a no-no, I was on uh, Q1, we got a no-notice call to cockpit, right, middle of the day, but into cockpit, hold cockpit ready, which means we'd start the APU, get everything strapped in, the next things that we'd start would be the engines, we'd go in the back, everything's coming up, the radar's going to be timing out, we're sitting with the INs coming up, everything's um, as hot as we can make it, and sitting on the telebrief, um, which is the secure connection, waiting on an update. And the ops centre is telling us they've got an unidentified track coming south. It's at 66,000 feet doing Mach 1.6. Bloody hell. What? I thought, well, what on earth is doing that? And they said, it is on a recognised air route, but we don't know its intentions, so we'll just hold you just now. Okay. And then something clicked in my head. I thought, no, they can't. They can't be that stupid. They cannot be that stupid. It must be something else. Anyway, they eventually said, uh, you're, you're clear to revert to RS-10, dismount. I said, what What was it? Uh, we'll talk to you on the secure phone when we get when you get in. Okay, so we'll get back to ops. Uh, I'm in the crew room. Phone goes. I pick it up. I said, that was Concord, wasn't it? How did you know that? There's an advert in the Daily Telegraph <laughs> saying that an Air France Concord is touring South America. <laughs> oh, we missed that. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> Talk about finger on the pulse. Jesus. Was it an enjoyable experience? Yeah, yes, it was. And there was quite a change in terms of an improvement of the facilities um, in, in my time. And for the guys who went there on the Phantom right at 1980. To, to 83, uh, it was pretty primitive what they had. Mm. Um, when I got there, they, there was no mobile phone coverage, so you were you got phone cards to go into a phone booth and long distance telephone calls home. You had free blueies, which are the the blue airmail letters. You got as many of those you could write, and they got sent back for you. Um, television, British Forces uh, uh, television. It was basically down the Falklands. It was a pre-recorded one channel mishmash of what they showed in Germany a couple of days before. There was a local radio station, there was a British Forces radio, which gave you something. But it was, you were pretty cut off. And being mm-hmm. in the 1990s, we hadn't quite got the mobile phone coverage and mania that we have now. Mm-hmm. Um, eventually, there was a limited internet connection in a little cafe that you could book in and you get your 10 minutes and it was all about frantic you booked in. Three wow. and, out, um, uh, and that worked um, but by the end there was fairly good uh, internet coverage so you could get it independently mobile phones as well um, the television had improved a lot um, and basically the connectivity to the islands had improved tremendously. So recreation wise, you certainly were not as cut off and you could all the big sporting events were being shown and stuff like that. Um, so there was, a, there was a bit of siege mentality to begin with, even more so mm-hmm. before my time. Um, when you felt, yes, we are a long way away and you're waiting on the, the supply ship arriving sort of style. But towards the end, you were, you know, you're pretty connected it wasn't fast, but you were as connected as anybody else, really, and you could stay up to date, which was good. Um, it meant you could be talking to the family at home, so if there was any snags, you were there, you were able to talk about it almost immediately, as opposed to, you know, well, I'll no, not know anything till three, four weeks coming home. Food was very good. Um, the moment the army's involved in food, it's always <laughs> going to be good. Yeah. The, you know, the, the catering is tremendous. Um, the other thing, it's a worldwide, it's a, a force wide problem, or it was in those days, the booze was really cheap. So they keep telling you not to That's drink and, and your hangovers and stuff like that. And then you go into the officer's mess bar and you're paying peanuts for the alcohol. So, <laughs> And sometimes <laughs> when the weather was bad, you think, yeah. well, that's really about all we can do here. So, um, yeah, it was, it was good. Once you get into your routine, as I say, when you've arrived, you're into your block, you know your accommodation, you know the routines, it becomes very simple. And then it's just towards that last week, you want to make sure, you want to get the word that your replacement crew is coming, yeah, and that the Gozobi bird, as we called it, the TriStar or latterly the airliner um, on the contract was coming down and, you know, there was no problems, you're going to get on. And then uh, 
once you got back to Bryce Norton, you think, oh, it's fine. It's good. <laughs> and, like, when you went out, uh, do you mingle with, um, you know, the locals and stuff like that, go to a bar and... Were you allowed yep. to tell them I'm a fighter pilot? You know, yeah. like I'm at the space. Yeah, 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 yeah. When we say mingle, well, there's there was a they don't do it anymore, but there was a a, a famous couple down as far as the uh, fighter crews were concerned, Jimmy and Guinea Forster, who owned a farm on West Falkland. It was a, uh, an out, an open invitation, standing invitation for any of the off fourteen thirty five flight. On the, they got a couple of days off or a day and a half off, etc. If they could get on the helicopter on the rotor uh, round trip, you could go out and stay with them. And we generally wow. would take some rations and stuff like that. They were excellent hosts. So we always made a point of going, flying over Jimmy and, uh, and Guinea's uh, farm. Or they've given it up now. I think they've moved to Stanley because um, they're, get, they're getting on in, in years. I haven't heard of them for a, a little while now. Um, but other than that, it was Stanley. You went to Stanley. Uh, and Stanley wasn't big. Um, I'll not try and give a town or a village comparison because everybody's all over the country, but you know, 2,000 people, maybe, mm-hmm. uh, total. Now, it did expand, but initially there was one pub, uh, the Globe Tavern, which was fairly basic but very friendly. Um, and then the advent of cruise ships came along, and they discovered that the Falklands was a good place to call in on because of the wildlife. <laughs> And cruise ships brought money, and that was a, a, a very substantial and significant revenue stream for Stanley um, and the islands as a whole. And so you got new, the hotel started to improve, they even got a brasserie in and more pubs and stuff like that. Um, but you had the situation of a cruise ship would come in and the population of Stanley would double for the day. Yeah. <laughs> All these people would come up, then spend money and then go away again. Um, so... But to, to answer your point, we would go to Stanley, you know, to at least weekly, something like that, and uh, get in uh, and sit in the Globe and what have you. And yet, because they, they loved the military, there was no problem. There was no sort of saying, well, we better not say who we yeah. are. They wanted to know who you were, who you are, and uh, they welcomed you with open arms. And I hope that's still the case now. Although it's 2009 was the last time I was down there, so... I realised things might have changed by then, but I hope not because it was it was a great place to be. It really was, and you feel like you're doing a good job because they want you right. there because they want to stay British, and we're yes, part of that to ensure that they do. And what's going on politically and all the rest of it, neither here nor there. The force that's in Mount Pleasant and around the Falklands, the naval bit and the army, etc., is all there to make to deter them from trying it again. Mm-hmm. I think they're doing a good job. Um, where did I go afterward? Well, these detachments were interspersed throughout my tours. So they're basically coming round about once every 10 months. Right. So all I do is go back to the squadron, and that's mm-hmm. it. There was only one, my very last deployment to the Falklands. I was coming back and was almost immediately having my last trip on the F3 mm-hmm. and then leaving the force. In, mm-hmm. uh, so I came back in January of '09. And then the 5th or the 6th of February, uh, 09 was my last trip on the F3. So that was the only time where I came back to the Falklands and then there was a big change. Other than that, just back in the squadron, might take a bit of leave, um, but you just pick up the normal routine again. And of course, for a, for a, for a, a number of years, around the, the late 90s, early 2000s to 2003, interspersed with my time in the Falklands, deployments to Iraq well yes. Saudi Arabia to cover the no-fly zone um, in the lead up to the second Gulf War um, so there was all that and then of course squadron detachments the red flags the distant frontiers um, uh, cope thunder whatever it is um, or but detached to Lithuania all of those are sprinkled in as well so it's just it makes up for a for, for a busy calendar um, um, but that was life that's what you signed up for um, yeah, again, like another question before we wrap up. Uh, did you have any choice? Like, if, if someone said, like, you're going to the Falklands, uh, this is what you're going to do, or could you say no? Bit of horse trading, really. Um, there was always somebody on the squadron who was his second, one of his second duties would be to produce the Falklands plot. Um, the squadron would be told, 
these are the dates that you are supplying a crew. Right. It was then down to the squadron to put the names in the frames. And they, would, they wouldn't be bloody minded about it if you'd already booked leave, if there was some course coming up, somebody getting married or whatever. Yes, you would negotiate. Right. But they would, you would have to take the pain of, you know, if the squadron's got a Christmas slot, i.e. you're going to be away down over Christmas and New Year. I had one, my last time down there was like that. Um, they'll look at who's done a Christmas down the Falklands and who hasn't. Those that haven't, right, start your excuses why you shouldn't be going. Right. So it was that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so you generally came to an agreement. Nobody was going, oh, please, can I go at the Falklands? Please go. <laughs> you were going, oh, it's coming around again. Yeah. Okay. But they would try and accommodate as much as possible. But at the end of the day, the squadron had to supply a crew down to the Falklands um, mm-hmm. at that time. Because if they didn't, it meant another squadron would be taking an extra load to, you know, because the, the, the flight needed its number of crews down there. So uh, it generally worked out pretty well. Yeah, Roy, what have you been up to anyway, like since uh, we last chatted? What's been happening? Well, as I, as I hinted last time, uh, I'm heavily involved with the Mid-Norfolk Railway, so uh, yes. doing quite a lot of time in the signal box. Uh, and uh, <laughs> doing I've time. got summer's worth coming up ahead uh, of working the two signal boxes there, uh, just enjoying myself pulling levers and watching steam trains and diesels go past. Uh, photography as ever, I'm quite keen on my photography, so um, Norfolk provides a a new area for me to have a look at yes. in terms of landscape. Wildlife around here is, is great. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. not exotic, but there's plenty of it. Yes. Um, so generally speaking, that uh, keeps me reasonably busy. And uh, the the village, little village we live in here, they're very friendly. They're desperately trying to get me to join the parish council. Much <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, there's plenty of things going on at the moment. Brilliant stuff. Well, Roy, thank you very much for coming on the show. As again, it's it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. And yeah, we'll chat soon, I'm sure. Yep, no bother. Look forward to it. Thanks very much indeed. Cheers, Roy.